the Bible Treasury. A monthly magazine of papers on scriptural subjects. Volume 15, Article 7, Part 8 of 13, 1884, and 1885. Wilderness Lessons. As the necessity of priesthood becomes more evident, so fresh details are given to the priests and Levites, and as grace widens in its sphere, so do the requirements of holiness become more precise and stringent, and the position of the priests more defined. And Jehovah said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, and thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. Numbers 18. Had there been no sanctuary, there could not have been this iniquity, for it is the presence of man in the holy place ere he came who by one offering perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10 verse 14. This perfection is not mere forgiveness, nor justification, but the whole question of sin met by Christ, so that iniquity is not imputed to us. Christ bore it all. This is foreshadowed in Exodus 28 verses 36 to 38, QV, where Aaron in his robes of beauty is the type of Christ now in the full exercise of his priesthood, who alone could put away this iniquity from those who now draw near to God through him. Here in number 18 is the condition of the priests of Israel who, before Christ came and had died to sin, bore their iniquity. Hence they could not pass the veil into the second tabernacle, Hebrews 9 verse 7. We enter in because we are purged. The sanctuary was the symbolic expression of God's holiness. The priest, though strictly observing all the ordinances the ceremonies of law, could not draw near with a purged conscience. His nature was impure, a truth not then declared, but implied in the words now spoken to Aaron. Sins were known, not sin. Indeed the whole history of the wilderness is to prove that sin is man's fallen nature, the constantly recurring sacrifices show not only their intrinsic valuelessness but also the sin inherent in man's nature. This evil of sin being unknown, it was never condemned and therefore a purged conscience was impossible, for it means the knowledge of good and evil, and the evil judged. An innocent conscience knows neither. Man was such that he could only acquire the knowledge of good when he had fallen under the power of evil, and under that power, he could not judge the evil, and it soon ceased to be evil in his eyes. If unknown and unjudged, it was there in him, and the blood of bulls and of goats which might avail for the purifying of the flesh, an outward thing, could never purify the conscience. Such a priest drawing near, and performing his duty, did of necessity defile the sanctuary. For while the vessels of the sanctuary, and the altar are holy and express the purity of God, the priest is the representative of the children of Israel, and they were unclean. As unclean in himself and in his representative character, he was a defiling element among the holy things of the sanctuary and must bear the iniquity of it. To meet his need, typically, sacrifices were offered for him, and blood offered even to purge the things of the sanctuary. The iniquity of the priesthood, not said of the priest, is, the office of priest was defiled by the same nature, for a priest should be holy, harmless, and undefiled. He was unpurged and represented a sinful people. Not his position as priest could purge him, rather it was the occasion of the iniquity, and made more prominent the necessity for one who could put away the defilement of nature, and also purge the conscience from all these dead works, for such is the word now applied by the Holy Spirit to all the ritual of the sanctuary, Hebrews 9 verse 14. Christians as priests draw near, but there is more of contrast than of analogy between their position and ours. We stay not at the altar without but enter within the veil. And we have no iniquity of the sanctuary to bear, for, though as to nature no better than they, Christ has met our need, we have with him died to sin, and the conscience is purged, we enter into the holiest of all. The type was theirs, the reality is ours, they had the patterns of heavenly things, we have the things themselves. This is the normal state of a believer and is practically enjoyed when walking faithfully before God. But is there not a meaning for us conveyed in the words, iniquity of the sanctuary, beyond the primary and special bearing on Aaron and his sons? Was it not intended by the Holy Ghost? For what is our place? Within the veil. 
We groan under the burden of the flesh, but we mortify it. We deny its lusts, and sin has no more dominion over us, its iniquity is not imputed. Its power is annulled to faith, but there it is, the flesh is in us. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But being perfected forever by the one offering we are before God in all the acceptability of Christ, and to bear as priests the iniquity of the sanctuary would be a denial of the infinite efficacy of the death of Christ. How if not perfected forever could we be at home within the veil in the presence of light? Now when a saint forgets the holiness which becomes the house of God, which house are we, then he must bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, that is, his sin is not gauged by its own guilt, but by the position which grace has given. It may not be flagrant, but what is alas? Far more common and so frequently unjudged, love of the things of the world, a sad inconsistency with our place within the veil. Because he is a priest, that which would not be noticed in an unconverted man becomes, through his position, iniquity. In this sense, he bears the iniquity of the sanctuary. A worldling not having that place cannot have that iniquity. Oh! Let us while rejoicing in the privileges of grace remember the responsibilities of holiness, which is now measured by the position conferred, and by the call to complete separation from the world. How is this to be attained? Only by watching and praying, and having the heart filled with the Lord. There is another contrast between us and the Levites who were joined to the priests and servants to them. They were not allowed to come nigh the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar. This was enforced by the penalty of death, and this not only upon the presuming Levite but also upon the careless priest, that neither they nor yet also, die. In the Church of God there is a distinction between priesthood and Levitical service, but not after the same pattern. In Israel, the Levite was not a priest, in the Church none but a priest can be a true Levite. The function of the Church is prayer, thanksgiving, and worship, of which the highest act is the Lord's Supper, and every saint is there as a priest, and every act by the Church is a priestly act, neither of these is Levitical service. The Levites now as then are to minister to the priests, i.e. the Church. Who are the Levites? Those who by teaching, exposition of the word, and pastoral work, by rebuke and admonition, warning against surrounding evil, watch over the saints and care for the flock of God. And as there were different orders of Levites in Israel, each with its assigned duties, so they also who had to serve tables, Acts 6 verses 1 to 4, were doing true Levitical service. All, whether teachers or simply caring for the wants of the poor, ministered to the saints of God. These servants are called of the Master, and take this service upon them not by constraint but willingly. He gave gifts. The Lord distributes to each according to his ability. These are the true Levites and were first priests, worshippers, before the call to any service. Teaching and preaching are not functions of the church, but of those whom the Master appoints. United prayer, thanksgiving, worship, are assuredly the privileges of all saints. The restricting of these privileges, the real and inalienable functions of the church, to the ministering servants of God, gave rise to the clergy, a separate class within the church, by which the order given in Numbers 18 is inverted. Then the Levites were joined to the priests to serve them, now the ministers i.e. the Levites, take precedence of the church the priests. Not like Paul who said, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Levitical service in this day is placed higher than priesthood, unless it be with those who claim to be priests, not in the true New Testament meaning, to the exclusion of all others. God's order in the types or his teaching through them is unknown. This use of God's gift, to exalt self, has created a sphere where even the world intrudes, to be a minister is one of the world's prizes, ministry is a profession. How great the evil! Yet the germ was small and looked not so bad at the beginning. But a minister, or gifted man, now going to the table to break bread, because of having a gift for teaching or preaching, and not because he is a priest led by the Spirit of God, would be as a Levite drawing near to the sanctuary to offer, 
the thing that all truth forbids. This one great characteristic meeting of the Church of God is to show the Lord's death in the breaking of bread. All other meetings, though right, necessary and even imperative, are only auxiliary to this. And I may add that the joy of the Lord's day morning meeting, the blessedness of remembering the Lord in his death, is never so fully realized by those who habitually neglect the auxiliary meetings, lectures and readings notwithstanding, helpful as these are to our growing in the knowledge of Christ our Lord. The one object of this meeting for the gathered saints is the Lord's Supper and not for exposition, or exhortation. After the remembrance of the Lord as he appointed, and if circumstances allow, the Levite may minister to the priests, seek to edify the saints. But where the Lord's Supper is hurried over at the beginning, or thrust into a corner at the close, the object of the gathering together is virtually lost sight of, the Lord dishonored and his love slighted. The ordinance of the red heifer was not peculiar to the priests nor the Levites, it was for the congregation, and the instruction for saints now is, not as a company of priests, nor as knit together by one spirit, but as pilgrims journeying through the wilderness. The sprinkled blood as on the Passover night secures us from judgment, the great day of atonement sets forth the full answer of the cross, a perfect redemption, to meet the need of guilty sinners, and to establish new relationships between God and the redeemed. In a word both, these ordinances contemplate the sinner, the red heifer is rather a provision for the believers, that they may be cleansed from all defilement, by the way, no less necessary for the saint than the shed blood is for the sinner. The truth taught by the red heifer is distinct from that conveyed by the Day of Atonement, but not so readily apprehended. The blood was sprinkled completely before the tabernacle, to remind us of our access to God by the one perfect sacrifice, and that all needed blessing, by the way, is founded upon the death or precious blood of Christ. Thus our cleansing is in virtue of it, just as much as forgiveness of sins when we first believed, for whether for saint or for sinner, it is ever his blood clean seth from all sin. But the blood of the red heifer is not applied to the defiled saint. It is Christ once offered to God, the perfect sacrifice which is never repeated, nor the blood sprinkled again before the tabernacle. Then all is burnt and the ashes remain, ever abiding in its purifying efficacy for every defilement. As often as defilement occurs, there are the ashes, not another red heifer, to sprinkle blood again before the tabernacle, or again to be burnt under the judgment of God. Christ bore it all once, and it is done forever. The cleansing of the believer is not with blood, but by ashes mingled with running water. It is the ashes that typify the ground of blessing, the water is only the medium. So the Apostle in Hebrews 9 verse 13 speaks of the ashes as sprinkled, not of the water. It is the power of Christ's death bearing our judgment, wholly consumed, ashes, and applied by the Holy Spirit using the word, water, to cleanse us from our defilement. The red heifer following the living rod shows the divine order of these types. The rod laid up in the ark before God was the witness of the intercession of Christ dead and risen, our advocate, so the red heifer is the result of his advocacy, the provision of grace for pilgrims defiled on their journey. It was fitting that Christ should be seen as high priest above before that which is surely the effect of his intercession was typified by the red heifer. If we may so say, this type is the complement of the living rod, both are founded upon the atoning blood, and neither meets the first need of the soul, for without shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. When that need is met, other needs are felt, we need one to appear in heaven for us, who has conquered sin and death, ever living to make intercession for us, and we have this in the beautiful fruit-bearing rod. Then we need that his intercession above should be made good in our souls while here below, and so following upon his advocacy, this need is also supplied in the red heifer. It is the Spirit of God working in us when we have strayed, as the fruit of his advocacy above. And so, as in all cases where the spirit works, there is a moral process in the soul, by which it is effectually restored, first, by self-judgment, hating the sin and judging oneself. This is the purification on the third day. The word has been applied, ashes mingled with running water, humiliation and confession before God. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Without this, there cannot be purification on the seventh day. But, on that day, for the purified Israelite there was readmission to the congregation. Not only was the defilement morally purged away, but the brand of exclusion was removed, and he could join again in the worship of Jehovah. The psalmist shows the same order in a soul's restoration, he first confesses his sin, then he prays that his sin may be blotted out, and, after that, the joys of salvation may be restored, Psalms 51, whatever the dispensation. God's ways of grace and of discipline are the same, the third day and the seventh illustrate the unchanging moral dealing of God with souls, the same reality in the church of God as with Israel of old. And it cannot be too often or too plainly asserted that the advocacy of Christ, the application of the word by the Holy Ghost, and the restoration of the soul are all consequent upon the blood of Christ, which has been shed, and sprinkled seven times and not again, before the tabernacle of God. Christ washing the feet of his disciples, John 13, answers somewhat to the sprinkling of the ashes of the red heifer in Numbers 19. Only the cleansing in Numbers is connected with the Spirit's work in the soul, in John 13. It is the Lord as advocate and we in our measure following his example. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, yet also ought to wash one another's feet. We do well also to mark the defiling nature of sin, for even a clean person, who had to do with the restoration of an unclean, was himself unclean till the even. It bespeaks the care and fear with which we should seek the restoration of another, lest the flesh should make us fail in hatred of the evil, or in grace to the unclean. None but the Lord could touch a leper and be himself without attaint. While God is thus bringing out the resources of grace, laying up stores of truth for the people that come after, Israel are also developing more evil. They are more daring and perverse. Going back into Egypt in their hearts was constant. Now, Numbers 20, they add the wish that they had died with their brethren before Jehovah. Had they forgotten that the death of their brethren was special judgment, and so awful that they had fled at the cry of them that were swallowed up? Because water is lacking, the congregation gather again against Moses and Aaron and chide them and say in effect they would rather have died under the fearful judgment of God than suffer thirst. Had they cried to God, he would have given them water as before. How true it is that neither judgment nor blessing changes man's nature. But grace appears and water is once more brought from the solid rock. It is not the same truth as at the rock Horeb, but a like absence of reproof for their murmuring. In Exodus 17 verse 5 the rock is smitten with the rod of authority, that of Moses. When judgment fell upon the Egyptians, when the Red Sea was divided for Israel, and closed again for the host of Pharaoh, when the rock, that rock was Christ, was smitten, the rod of government was the fitting one. While it was the symbol of judgment upon Egypt, it brought blessing, water, to Israel. Then it could be used in dispensing grace, for Israel had not then put themselves under law so that the rod of government imparted blessing, their sinful murmurings notwithstanding. Here in Numbers, it is a very different thing. Moses is told to take the rod, that particular rod bearing fruit, for the rod of authority and power will not, ought not, to give water to a murmuring people under law. In such a condition, where man can only be a transgressor, government can but condemn and put to death. But he who can have mercy upon whom he will, commands the fruit-bearing rod of Aaron to be taken, the emblem of the abiding efficacy of priesthood, of Christ as alive from the dead. This was the rod suited for the occasion. The people were not without law, but they were the objects of grace then, that we might learn the value of Christ's priesthood. Nothing more was needed than to speak to the rock. Christ was smitten once, he cannot be smitten again. By that one smiting he is still the source of, living water for thirsty souls in the wilderness. Then it was typically to be taught. Now we know it by the power of the Holy Ghost. But Moses and Aaron at this moment stand apart from the congregation, not in faithfulness as on previous occasions. They do not apprehend the sovereign grace of God. It is now their testing time, and they both fail, 
for neither had learned the import of the rod. In anger Moses took his own rod, but what right had he to be angry when God would show only mercy? Both he and Aaron must die in the wilderness. Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. How did they fail to sanctify God? Not doing as commanded. The truth of priesthood as taught by the rod was set aside as if of no avail for the people, and with no more significance than confirming Aaron in his office, or in fact merely of use as a token against the rebels. But God is most jealous of all and everything that interferes with his grace. God remembered mercy, Moses thought of their sin. God looked at the rod as a pledge of grace, Moses saw only the token. Not seeing the mercy side of the rod, what wonder that he took his own rod, symbol of the righteous government of God and said, Hear now, ye rebels, a word that Jehovah did not put into his mouth. No doubt, it was a fresh lesson of mercy and forbearance, and deeper than Moses had yet seen, for his rod must give place to the intercessory power of the priest. He was told to speak to the rock, but he smote the rock and in his anger smote twice. Moreover, so jealous was he for authority that he for the moment forgot his own place as servant. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? Where was the honor due to God in his saying we? None so meek as Moses, but here he failed and did not sanctify God in the people's eyes. His own place and authority filled his mind, there was no room at that moment for the thought of grace, yet had he not learned enough of the people and their sin, that nothing but grace could bring them through the wilderness. His indignation might be righteous but his words were hasty, and the gravamen of his sin was interfering with God's grace. God would be sanctified according to his grace, not then by judgment. Therefore Moses could not enter the land. He mourned over this exclusion to his last days. I must die in this land. Did he fully judge his own failure as the righteous reason why he should not pass the Jordan? The Lord was wroth with me for your sakes, and would not hear me, and the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter, Deuteronomy 3 verse 26, 4 verse 22. But God lays it upon him and Aaron, because ye trespassed against me. The people no doubt were the occasion, but the trespass was their own, Moses and Aaron, in a certain sense, we would say it with submission, disobeyed too, Numbers 20 verse 24, Deuteronomy 32 verse 51. If the servants fail to sanctify God, he will sanctify himself. Their failure cannot change the character of grace, which indeed shines all the more through their failure. Though he smote the rock twice, and contrary to the word of Jehovah, yet the water flows. Such is grace rising above every hindrance, supplying every need. When was it otherwise? In our own lives how many times we have proved and rejoiced in similar goodness of God. We daily learn, and, as we learn, wonder and adore. Our daily lessons are grace, the manner of God's teaching is grace. Yeah, grace expresses in a word the full process of the Holy Spirit by which we as believers are brought into communion with his thoughts and ways, and thus become intelligent worshippers of our God. This is what the whole church of God is not but should be. Israel are not yet brought to apprehend the mercy of God, but their day is coming. But intelligent worship is now the privilege of the church. What will it be when grace is crowned with glory?